In this video, we explain how to calculate the change in entropy in the surroundings in the context of the second law. Right, so the second law of thermodynamics allows you to predict whether a process will be spontaneous or not. The only thing that you need to do is to calculate what the change in entropy in the universe is for that particular process. Right, so delta S of the universe has to be larger than zero for a spontaneous process. If you calculate a delta S of the universe that is negative, then you can conclude right away that the process will not happen as written without any external aid. Right, notice that the universe has two components, the system and the surroundings. Right, so uh, you can rewrite this expression simply as the sum of the entropies of the system and the surroundings. Okay, so if we know how to calculate the change in entropy in the system and in the surroundings, then we will be able to make predictions about, uh, about any particular process that we may be interested in. So far, we have learned how to calculate the change in entropy in the system for things like a gas expansion or a phase transition or a heating and cooling process and so forth. But we still do not know how to calculate the change in entropy in the surroundings. That's what we're going to learn to do right now and then we will do a numerical example. Right, so the definition of the change in entropy in the surroundings is no different than it is in the system. This is the heat reversible in the surroundings over the temperature. Now, something that is uh, important about the surroundings is that they are huge compared to the size of the system. Right, so every single change uh, in the system, uh, any transfer of energy between the system and the surroundings, will mean that uh, uh, that energy transfer will be infinitesimal for the point of view of the surroundings because they are so large. If the surroundings are whatever is the universe minus the system, then again, uh, any change in the system will be microscopic, infinitesimal in the surroundings. And that is kind of the definition of a reversible process, right? Uh, uh, what that means is that everything in the surroundings will actually be reversible right away, and we can automatically draw off this label reversible from the surroundings and simply write that. Okay, and again the reason is that the surroundings are so large. Now, uh, we still need to calculate what is the heat in the surroundings and uh, generally in chemistry and in molecular sciences uh, we're not so worried about the surroundings. What we know how to do quite well is to work with the system. So it would be, it would be terrific if we actually were able to recast the heat in the surroundings as something that depends on the system because we can handle the system quite well. We know how to calculate the heat in the system for a gas expansion, a chemical reaction, phase transition, heat and cooling. That is very easy to do. To do. Uh, we don't know how to do it in the surroundings, but if, if the surroundings are somehow connected to the system, then that should be an easy calculation. And it turns out that the, the surroundings are really connected to the system. If this is your system and the rest of the universe is the surroundings, then what happens is that, well, uh, there's a direct relationship between the heat uh, for a process in the system and the surroundings. If the heat is positive in the system and it's plus one joule, then that one joule will end up absorbed by the surroundings because the surroundings completely engulf the system, right? So, so it's very easy to see that uh, for every single case, what will happen is that any single, any single joule of energy exchange between the system and surroundings will be the same magnitude in the system and surroundings that will just have a different sign. Right? If it's an exothermic process, then uh, heat will be negative from the perspective of the system, but all that heat that has been released by the system is absorbed by the surroundings, which means uh, that you will have to change the sign. So that is how, uh, how we calculate the heat, the heat in the surroundings which means that now the calculation of the entropy in the surroundings seems straightforward because we have just referred it to the system. Okay? Now we can take this a little bit further and if we assume that we're working at constant pressure then we know right away what this is. If we're working at constant pressure then this is simply the change in enthalpy in the system divided by temperature. But again, uh, this equality here requires constant pressure which is not always true even though it is going to be true for most of the examples that we're going to see uh, here. All right, so to illustrate these concepts, uh, we're going to try to uh, apply this to a numerical example. Okay, and the example is going to be as follows. Suppose that we have a container 
uh, in which we're mixing hot water and cold water. Okay, so this is hot water at 100 Celsius, and we have one mole. And here we have cold water at uh, zero Celsius, and there will be three moles. The temperatures uh, are zero and 100 uh, uh, Celsius, right, and this is liquid water. Okay, now we have this in a container that is called adiabatic. Okay, and what that means is that this container is insulated so that no energy skips the system into the surroundings. Okay, so the goal is going to predict uh, uh, whether if we lift this barrier, we we'll remove it somehow, whether the mixing of that hot and cold water will be spontaneous or not. Our prediction is that it should be spontaneous, right? If you lift that wall, then you're not going to have hot and cold water anymore. You're going to have four moles of lukewarm water, okay? Uh, but the question is, is, is this borne out by uh, the calculations, right? By the calculation of the change in entropy of the universe in this particular process. All right, so to calculate the change in entropy of the universe, we have to calculate the change in entropy in the system and in the surroundings. Let's start with the system first. Notice that your system is divided into two subsystems. Subsystems, uh, subsystems. One of them is the hot water, and the other one is the cold water. Okay, so uh, then the change in entropy in the system is simply going to be equal to the sum of the change in entropy of both of those. Okay, and the change in entropy for the uh, hot or the cold, uh, because the only thing that is happening here is just a change in temperature. That is provided by N times the heat capacity molar natural log of the final temperature of that water and the initial temperature of that water. Okay, notice that we have uh, uh, the number of moles for the hot and cold is one mole or three moles. The molar heat capacity of water, if this is liquid water, then we know that as well, is 75.3 joules per mole Kelvin. And then the initial temperatures we know. We know the initial temperature of the hot water, 100 Celsius, and of the cold water, 0 Celsius. What we don't know is the final temperature. So that is going to be our first calculation before uh, we're able to obtain the changes in entropy in the hot and cold water and therefore the change in entropy in the system. Right? We must calculate what the final temperature is. And to do that, we can recognize that because this is adiabatic, okay, uh, the energy transferred uh, uh, from the uh, hot water to the cold water uh, uh, is the same as from the cold water to the hot water, in other words. What you have is that the key of the hot water has to be equal to key of the cold because, again, no energy is lost. Okay, so uh, hot water getting cooler is an exothermic process. It uh, transfers energy, but that energy is absorbed by the cold water, which in turn becomes uh, hotter. Okay, so the question is, well, what is that final temperature? Well, this is not difficult to, to calculate. We know that this is just a heating and cooling process. So we will have that uh, the number of moles of the hot water multiplied by the heat capacity, and then the change in, in uh, temperature for that hot water, which is the final temperature minus the initial temperature of the hot water, has to be equal to the number of moles of the cold water, heat capacity of liquid water, and then the final temperature, which we're assuming is the same uh, for the hot and the cold, whatever it is, it should be the same, the final temperature, minus the initial temperature of uh, the cold water. All right, so we have all the data. Number of moles of H is just of hot water is one mole. Number of moles of cold water will be three moles. The heat capacity of water for both is 75.3 joules per mole Kelvin, but they are the same number. We're assuming that it's constant, so this cancels out. And then uh, the initial temperature of the hot water will be 373 Kelvin. And then the uh, initial temperature of the cold water will be 273 Kelvin. When uh, you only have one unknown, which is the uh, final temperature of that water, and when you do the calculations, you find that this final temperature is 298 Kelvin, 25 Celsius. All right, so then the hot water will go from 100 Celsius to 25 Celsius, and then the cold water will go from 0 Celsius to 25 Celsius. Well, great. Because we have the final uh, temperature, now we're ready to calculate the changes in entropy in both the hot and the cold water. Okay, so let's uh, do each one in turn. All right, for uh, the hot water, this is going to be the number of moles that I have of hot water, which is one mole, 
the heat capacity of liquid water, which is 75.3 joules per mole Kelvin, and then the final temperature, which is 298 Kelvin, over the initial temperature of the hot water, which is 373 Kelvin. Okay, that will be the change in entropy of the hot water. Right. We can anticipate what the sign of this change in entropy should be. Okay, we know that hotter substances are uh, more entropic than colder substances, right? Because this uh, water is cooling down, then we should expect a negative change in entropy. And notice that that would actually be the case because you have, you're taking the natural log of a number that is smaller than one, and that means that the, uh, that number would be negative. Okay, so uh, that is correct. And what you get out of this is equal to minus 16.9 joules per Kelvin. Okay, so that um, wa uh, hot water has lost uh, some entropy because it's, it's becoming cooler. Now we have to do exactly the same thing for the cold water and then see uh, what the change in entropy would be. For the cold water we have 3 moles and then uh, the heat capacity is exactly the same. And then we have the natural log of the final temperature which is 298 Kelvin over the initial temperature which is 273 Kelvin. Okay, now you're taking the natural log of a, a number larger than one, which will be positive, okay? And this makes perfect sense. You should expect that cold water, once you put some energy into it, becomes more entropic. The entropy increases, so delta S for the cold water should be positive, and it is. Um, uh, what you get out of the calculation is that this is equal to 19.8 joules per Kelvin. Okay, so now we have the t uh, change in entropy of the hot water, the cold water, and that means that we have the change in entropy in the entire system, which happens to be positive. Okay, you put those two numbers together, and then you find that this is equal to plus 2.9 joules per Kelvin. Okay, so from the perspective of the system, uh, overall, the entropy has increased. Yes, it is true that for the hot water, the entropy has decreased, but for the cold water, the entropy, entropy has increased so much that the sum is still an increase in entropy for the entire system. Right, uh, we have the change entropy in the system, but notice that to uh, make a prediction of spontaneity, we actually need to also calculate the change in entropy in the surroundings. Okay, so the question is how do we do that? Well, the change in entropy in the surroundings is equal to minus Q of the system divided by T. Okay, but notice that in this particular case we're now uh, interested in uh, the amount of energy transfer between the system and the surroundings. We have calculated the, amount of the uh, heat in between the two subsystems. Now that that's the calculation that we did for the final temperature. But now we're interested in the heat between the system and the surroundings. Uh, notice that we have designed these systems such that those walls are adiabatic, which means that there's no energy transfer at all between the system and the surroundings, right? So what this means is that the heat in the surroundings and the heat in the system happen to be zero, and the delta S of the surroundings uh, uh, is zero. Okay, there's no energy transfer between the system and surroundings by design from this adiabatic wall, and what that means is that the surroundings uh, are not noticing anything that is happening in the system, so there's no change in the entropy of the surroundings uh, at all. So what that means is that we can calculate uh, finally what this is. Notice that that is going to be plus 2.9 joules per Kelvin plus zero, and that means that uh, the change in entropy of the universe is 2.9 joules per Kelvin. The most important thing here is that that number is positive, and that sign tells you that the process will be spontaneous. That's the power of the prediction. Obviously, we know that this should happen, right? When you have when you mix cold and hot water, you end up getting lukewarm water. However, the opposite is not true, right? Notice that if we were to reverse the process where you have lukewarm water, you never expect that to automatically or naturally separate into hot water and cold water. Okay, now we know that the reason for that is actually provided by the second law of thermodynamics. That would, that would lead to uh, an entropy of the universe, a change in entropy of the universe that is negative, and that means that the process is just not spontaneous. It will not happen naturally. All right, so in this video we have introduced the second law and we have introduced also how to calculate the change in entropy in the surroundings. Finally, we have applied uh, that second law uh, to calculate um, the change in entropy in the universe in the mixing of hot and cold water. 
and we have seen that the second law bears our expectations.